Hello and welcome to RYA Sailability's Safety Guidance Notice video. So what are we going to explore? We're going to look at why do we need safety guidance? We're going to look at our approach to safety. We're going to think about our way training. We're going to look at our procedures, our preparation and the regular checks we should make. We're going to think about the people, that's the sailors and the volunteers. And we're going to have a look at some of the other issues that may affect how we make a decision about around safety. And then we're going to look at how we make that decision around safety. So why do we need this? Lots of sailability groups have requested guidance around safety boats. Also, the RY safety boat course. We know it can help lots of sailability groups and we want to look at how it can help them. And there's also a number of groups who aren't RY training centres. Also, as sailability, we need to develop some more volunteer training and we want, and we know that our sailability groups want to develop their volunteer training. And also there has been a number of incidents over the years and we had one serious one last year. We are learning from these incidents and we wanted to share that knowledge with all the sailability groups. An approach to safety. We need to make sure that risks are assessed, that procedures are detailed and things are written down. We need to make sure that people are trained and they know what to do and how to do it. We need to make sure that competent people are given responsibility and authority to deliver activity. And incidents and near misses are reflected on and reported. The RYA Safety Boat course and the Safety Boat Handbook, the G16. Well, the RYA Safety Boat course and the accompanying resources outline a range of knowledge, competencies and techniques for ensuring that people are safe and for the recovery of different types of craft. But does it work for us in sailability? Well, the answer is yes. The content is relevant and applicable to the craft commonly used by disabled people across the sailability programme. So procedures, preparation, regular checks. What do we mean by this? Well, all groups need to have considered the risks and they need to have written procedures. They need to practice these procedures. Everybody that operates a safety boat needs to be able to demonstrate the skills required. It's not enough to say you have loads of experience or that you understand what's required. You need to actually be able to do it. All equipment needs to be regularly checked and all volunteers need to be familiar with all equipment and rigging. That's not just the safety boats. That's all the equipment you're using, all the sailing boats, etc. And all incidents, no matter how small, should be reported. So what do we need to think about? What procedures do we need? How will we practice? Here's an interview with a member of Whitefriars Sailability. Hi, can you tell us who you are and where you're from? So I'm Rupert Whelan. Uh, I work with um, Sailability at Whitefriars. I'm the, the SI there, so the senior instructor in charge of the day. Cool, brilliant, thank you. Um, you've already answered my question about what your ro what role is. What you, you described what your role is, you said you're the SI. But what does that mean? What does that mean for the day at your celebrity group? So as senior instructor, you're in charge really. You're, you're making sure that nothing bad happens. So if something does happen, the buck stops with me. So I have to make sure that it isn't going to reach that point. So it involves starting right at, well before the, the day begins with making sure that we're going to have the right people there. And it carries on through the day until you know the very end making sure everybody's gone home everyone's safe everything's put away and that's you know locking up for the day at the end perfect yeah i was i was thinking about procedures i've talked in this this video in, as a whole about procedures and people having procedures i, I assume you guys at wi fis have some good procedures in place is that is that correct yes so we've got um a whole you know operating procedures big thick book of them basically uh, with lots of then addendums on the end where we're putting uh, risk assessments in, slotting them in. But all that, that whole thing begins with deciding what's safe. So we've talked about it, we've put risk assessments together, and the risk assessments are for the club, so whether the slipways are safe, um, whether access is good, where we can go in the club, how we can set the club up so people can get around it, the boats, 
making sure the boats are fit for purpose and all that and what we have to do with the boats to make sure that they're regularly serviced I suppose the world would be that they're safe for people and that will all be in there uh, what people's roles are is in there as well so the, the three roles which are not for the day um, so the SI is a role which is a you know a role which starts it's an all-week round role um, but there's also then uh, the booking manager who is working all week on it and that person's often then the reception person so they will have all the information about the people that are coming and then we'll have a role of the I suppose that you could call it the beach master we sort of call it session coordinator and again they will be involved making sure we're getting the right boats the right equipment the right volunteers for the sailors who are coming so we put all that then together those roles the responsibility of those roles are all in the uh, operating procedures perfect thank you Rupert yeah that makes complete sense what we didn't mention is you guys have a landlord in a sense because you're based at a sailing club so you're operating within their, within their rules as well as your own rules yes yeah and we're an RTC so we're operating within those rules as well. Yeah, which so an RTC, a recognised training centre, you guys operate under a, as an R R way training centre, yeah. Yeah, which does mean it makes our life easier because we didn't have to write our operating procedures <laughs> from scratch because we already yes. had a load of stuff in place. Can I ask you something about a typical day, Rupert? Can I ask you, when you come in in the morning, you already mentioned that the day starts for you before you even get there, but when you get on site, first thing in the morning before a sailability session, what kind of things do you think about? What do you consider before you start the day? So the first thing would be the weather. Yeah. Undoubtedly, get down there, see white horses, panic a little bit. <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's really getting down there and just sussing out whether the weather, the weather looks like the weather forecast. That's, that's one of the early bits, getting a, an anemometer out, seeing what the wind strength actually is or whether I'm just being a coward that day. Um, and then I'm going off and finding all the kit that's needed. So I'll be down there from about eight o'clock in the morning. Um, by the time the others arrived, I'll have got the sails out, put them by the boats. Um, I'll have started writing my daily risk assessment. So I'll have gone and checked the hoist. Um, I've made sure that we've got all the boats in roughly in working order. And I'll, I'll just go through and I'll just really make sure that we're set up and ready to run the day safely. Yeah. So from there, other people will start arriving. Um, they'll start rigging the boats. We'll get the power boats in. Again, they'll get checked. We'll check the radios. Um, and then on my, on my risk assessment form, so starting with the weather, how many safety boats are we going to need? Do we have enough people to drive? Are there enough yeah. qualified drivers? Have we got enough people to assist those people so we can go two up? Um, then I've got the hoist check, the radio check. Um, and then the really big question is, have we got actually got enough volunteers coming to run the day? So mm -hmm. I'll normally know beforehand who is likely to arrive, but things happen sometimes. Um, and we'll end up with two or three key people not being able to come. And then I'll have to work out who's gonna have to step up in many ways, who's, who's got the skills, but doesn't normally take the responsibility and they will then often step in and prove to be really good at what they do and from that point I know I've got somebody else who can who can do those jobs um, so then also some days there'll be other things happening so there might be courses on in which case we have to talk to whoever's running stuff in order to make sure that we're sharing the water and we're not going to get in each other's way um, and from there it's a question of risk so yeah. is the risk a low risk in which case we can do everything we normally do medium risk do we have to put some reefs in is it going to be wise to not run some of the boats um and high risk um well nobody's going on water or we'll just do power boat rides um yeah. maybe take the lugger out without the sails up and and just do on the water stuff or on the shore stuff which is safe in the conditions so yeah. that's that's how the day begins really makes sense what about as the day goes on Do you, is there things you're monitoring things you're thinking about during the day so yes yeah, certainly 
monitoring who is out there. So obviously we've got the volunteers there for the day, but our sailors are only there for hour long sessions. So who's coming down next? What will they need? Who are they going to be there with? Um, are we talking to the reception people about that? Are we talking to the session coordinator? And we'll make sure that everything that we do for those people is set up in time as well. So are people going to need specialist equipment on the boat? Are they going to need a comfy chair because they've got a bad back? And so we've got a lot of that written down. Some of it's just in our heads, the sort of the little details, because it's hard to write every detail down. But yeah, we hope that when they come down, everything's ready for them. We've got the boat, we've got the equipment, and we've got the volunteers who know them ready to go out and sail. Yeah. Um, so as well as that, obviously, there's always looking to windward, um, looking at the big black clouds coming over, waiting for the next front, um, looking at that, working out whether it's time to bring boats off the water, if there's going to be a squall coming through. Um, if there's suddenly, you know, you can see that black cloud half a mile away, it's time to radio the power boats, get them to bring everyone ashore. And then when the rain squall hits, we're already ashore, so there's no issues. Yeah. Um, so that sort of thing goes on all day. Um, yeah. Obviously, on a nice benign blue sky day, there's a lot less to think about. Um, it might be there that you're thinking about how long is that power boat driving now? Are yeah, they getting right. thirsty? Yeah. Do they need cake? That's always a good question. <laughs> All celebrated groups need cake. So we might actually run power, but we'll use one of the power boats to run tea and cake out to the other power boats. <laughs> so Just there's keeping your volunteers happy and <laughs> hydrated. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, sadly, no cider allowed at that time of day. <laughs> <laughs> it, Can I, it does work. Yeah. Can I change the subject slightly? Um, you mentioned procedures and things. We, we, you and me have talked in the past about procedures and how you deal with potential things that might happen with boats. How do you look at that? How do you think about how your volunteers, are they trained? How do you how do you do that? How do you get your procedures in place? So we play. So we start well pre-season. Mm -hmm. uh, we get the volunteers down. So we'll get, a, usually it's a core group. You won't get everybody down, but you'll get enough down that those you know you've got a core group of people who know exactly what's going on. And they will then work on the day with the people they're with in power boats or um, who they're with sailing to disseminate that information. But you get enough people, we probably would get it pre-season 20 people, 25 people down to the sessions where firstly we go sailing. I need to make sure that their sailing standard is good enough. I need to make sure what sort of boats that they're happy sailing as well. So we use Panzer three and threes and you, you don't have to be a fantastic sailor to be a buddy in one of those because really you only have to remember that if you push the stick left it goes left yeah um, and if they can sail out turn around sail back to shore then with a little bit more work then that sort of person is quite happy being a buddy but if it's a, a reef down trio on a windy day then that sailor has to be confident that they can sail that boat they can sail it out there, they can sail it and keep it flat, and they can do that while only concentrating, what, 10% on the boat and 90% yeah. on the long board as well. So our training does all that. We then do power boat training. So we're using elements of safety boat course. Obviously, we don't need to build a rescue kite surface, but we're using those systems in order to make sure that if something does happen, if a boat capsizes, if someone falls overboard, that that power boat driver can without really having to think about the procedures, go and rescue that person or bring that boat up right or tow a, a 303 out of the trees, whatever it happens to be. And we do that by doing these things. We capsize boats, we turtle boats. I had a wonderful time once sailing a 303 into the shallows. It was a windy day. It was over at a sort of angle and I just carried on sailing and the keel was bumping bottom. And then I stopped and sat there. And the power boats all came over and scratched their heads a lot because the only way that they could see to get me out would have been to do that. And the keel would have been standing on the bottom and the boat would have flopped over again. So I wasn't sure how they were going to do it either, to be honest. <laughs> but they figured out ways in the shallows of getting that boat back into the water, into the water again. And from that, we could then teach it. 
so this is about some safe experimentation, isn't it? This is taking your volunteers out in a safe environment and letting them experiment, letting them work out how that's going to happen. So you learn and they learn how this is actually going to happen and then put your procedures in place at the back of it. Yeah, and we capsize the field boats, which is, again, an interesting experience if you're in them at the time when they're being capsized. Um, I don't like water very much, so I'm sort of clinging on like this. And we discovered from that that if you cling on in a hamster, it doesn't come up right again. As soon as I let go, pop, up it came. Because I was hanging out the side of it, it wouldn't come up. So we now know that if someone's doing that, that it's not going to come up. They're petrified and clinging onto it while it's flat in the water. It's going to stay there. And from that, then we can talk to people in the boats. We can get them to relax and the boat will pop up and just become its normal swimming pool. Brilliant. Fantastic, Rupert. Thank you for that. Um, before we finish, can I, can I ask you a question? I'm going to ask you something. Give me three things you think are important about uh, being the the senior instructor or the officer of the day for, for a sailability group. What are three things? Top of your head, three things are important. The weather, definitely. The weather. weather. Uh, volunteer experience. So have you got the right people? And cake. Probably cake. <laughs> cake. Brilliant. Thank you, Rupert. Thank you ever so much for that. Okay, no problem. So let's think about people, both sailors and volunteers. Providers of any activities have a clear duty of care to keep those involved in that activity safe. Any assessment has to take into account where you are boating, the type of activity you're engaged in and the conditions on the day. The person who's going sailing with you knows themselves and what they can and can't do, how they function, how they react. While one person may make the decision whether activity goes ahead and what resources are needed to ensure any activity is safe, it will be a number of volunteers that will help deliver that activity. So I've mentioned our sailors and that they know about themselves. So what, how do we find out about our sailors? We need to think about what is important to our sailors and that's not just safety, that may be about how they feel about things, what they expect to get from sessions and that type of thing. We need to think about what we need to know. We also need to ask the right questions. Between us and the sailor, we know most of the answers. We just need a conversation. And then we then need to make decisions based on what we learn. We have sailability's guidance on how to have these conversations. And this can be found in our getting to know people guidance. So what are some of the other issues we need to think about? We need to think about personal flotation, buoyancy aids and life jackets. There's lots of different equipment for different circumstances. This may be something to talk to your disability development officer about if you're not sure of the right equipment to use in the right circumstance. What about strapping, harnesses and other equipment? You'll find lots of strapping. People are strapped into seats. People are held into boats. You need to think about that kind of equipment. How does it work? How does it undo? How does it fit to the boat? Is every boat the same? You need to think about that kind of thing. Self-writing boats. The very fact that they're called self-writing suggests they are capable of going over you need to think about what might happen if a boat goes over. Adaptations to boats. Have you changed something from the manufacturer's original boat? If you make changes, you need to think about that effect on that boat. When you think about recovering people, how are we going to get people out of the water? There's many different ways of doing this, but we need to think about how we're going to recover people from the water. And then finally, once everybody's safe, we need to think about recovering boats. How do we get boats back? Those boats might be damaged, something may have happened to them. We need to get those boats back to shore. How do we do that? So how do we run bigger sailability events? And how do we train our sailability volunteers? What's important? Here's an interview with one of the sailability team. Hi, can you tell me who you are and what you do? Uh, hi, my name's Brett Kikane. I am the Sailing Disability Development Officer for the Midlands. Uh, but I also do a lot of event safety. Ah, event safety. I, now I know a bit about you. You've done some big stuff, haven't you, Brett? Uh, yeah, I've uh, been event safety officer for uh, a few big events. So uh, a laser world championships um, and then things like the Olympics and the Paralympics. So I looked after the sonars at the Paralympics and I built a team around myself really to work with uh, the 49 fleet um, at the Olympic Games in Weymouth. Fantastic. And you also do some stuff for us as sailability, don't you? 
Yeah, so uh, done some event safety, uh, including multi-class um, and, and some odd other events that we, we held as our way saleability. Right, fantastic. So I want to pick your brains a bit, Brett, about a few things about safety and training volunteers and things like that. So a, a typical sailability day, a session and everything, what should we be thinking about at the start of a day before you come down to a session? What should you think about if you're going to be um, in show? Sorry, yeah, if it's, a, if it's a typical sailability day um, at, at kind of club level, obviously start looking at forecasts before you get there um, and making sure that the conditions are suitable for whatever activity you're planning to deliver on that day. Um, and then upon arrival, um, one of the things I always do is check, if you're not sure, but go and check what else is happening at that sailing club on that day, so other activities. Um, so I always find out what else is going on if I turn up at an event or I'm running something for a sailability club so that um, I have an understanding of where the sailing area is, where we're allocated to sail and just what other boats are out there really. So if there's high performance boats sailing around with, uh, for example, Hansers or Challengers, uh, you need some consideration and about where you might uh, sail to and from our course area just to make sure that everyone's keeping safe. Um, that's, where, that's where I would start. Brilliant. Is there anything changes during the day? What do you think about during the day? Especially big events. You do big events as well as typical sailability sessions. What do you think about during the day when you're on the water running sessions? Uh, so if it's a multi-class event, kind of a bit more detail in the morning with the race officers, that's that type of thing. But as the day goes on, it's monitoring uh, the sailors and the conditions. So, so for example, if it's a coastal event, we might be monitoring other traffic coming through or shipping movement. Um, but also just regularly driving around the sailors uh, in between their sailing session just to see how they're doing. So if the conditions are slightly yeah. challenging or maybe really hot, it's very easy for the sailors to get dehydrated. And it's pretty easy just with a conversation to, to assist them with a top up on water or to make sure that they're all right. Um, and as the day goes on, those sailors are getting much tired, tighter. So, um, you know, they they might think they're all right or they might want to finish the race if, in that racing environment. But we have to keep an eye on them and actually make that call as to, yeah, you've been in this boat too long now. You're looking pretty tired. Let, let's get you back because it's the knock on effect uh, yeah. in the sailability world. So uh, their partners, wives, husbands, uh, carers, it's normally them that come up to us the next day and said you gave them a session that was too long. And actually the impact hits them a day later or two days later. Because they're busy enjoying the sailing and they're not thinking they're about sailing, the impact. The sailing, but the impact that has potentially, not every time, but sometimes the amount of time on the water and that physical exertion, we just have to be a bit careful on the time time that they're out on the water. Brilliant, fantastic. I'm going to change the subject on you slightly, Brett. I was chatting with Rupert earlier and we were talking about running sessions for volunteers and training volunteers. Is it, have you got any thoughts about if you what you need to consider when you start to train your volunteers in safety boat operations? Um, I think understanding the the basic principles. So a lot of the safety boat principles apply within the RYA guidance and the safety boat um, booklets. Um, but there are a few I don't know what you call them tweaks. I guess that maybe need to be considered for working with the type of boats that we work with and the individuals. So um, just making them aware of most stuff's the same but there are some subtle little changes uh, around working with the sailor or the types of types of boat i think understanding the boat's incredibly important if you're yep. not familiar with the sailability boats um, it's very easy to see a boat sailing around that hasn't capsized um, but actually is in a bit of difficulty or needs some assistance so being able to identify that i think for volunteers is really really important brilliant and on that same subject, if we were going to go on the water and run a session with some volunteers, what do we need to think about? What do we need to consider? Um, I think about how we approach these boats. Um, so some of these boats um, sit a lot lower in the water. So the practicalities of how you approach a boat in, in certain conditions. Um, also coming alongside the boat and holding on to the boat. Um, sometimes you need to shield the sailor from the, the weather or the waves, possibly. So you wouldn't normally um you know the traditional way you might put a boat head to wind but in some of the boats that we sail around with and we've experienced you put a boat head to wind and that sailor's pretty much under the water with every wave that rolls over the top of them so again you have to make that slight adaption to how you sit your boat for the conditions you're in to support that sailor or work with that sailor 
Um, I think I think that's really important. I think the familiarisation of the boats as well. So I've certainly been in situations where I've had to have a look at the boat and understand how I drop the mainsail on that boat or how I make adjustments to that boat if it's got some sort of electrical servos in it so that if there's a problem out on the water I've got a better understanding of what I'm going to do and how to approach it. So I think from a volunteer perspective it's trying to get that information across to those volunteers so they've got a better understanding. And if we're actually going to run a session on the water, there's, there's a few obvious things. The obvious one that springs to mind is we're not going to put anybody in the water if we run a volunteer training session. But is there any other thoughts on what we could and couldn't do, Brent? Yeah, yeah, definitely thinking about safety of our, our own team and our crew. Um, um, thinking about how you, if you had a problem with a boat, how you would get that boat back to the shore, but with the sailor in it. It's not always possible to remove the sailor. So, so there's that consideration where, uh, I don't know, club level, you might, pull somebody out of a boat or put them into the rib and then sort out the boat. There are scenarios and situations where that's just not possible within the sailability world. Um, so, so making sure that we understand the sailor's needs and, and we're not actually um, causing any injury to that sailor, having a good under, understanding of that sailor and what they can and can't do and what we can do to help them. Fantastic. Um, last thing, Brett. Can you give me three things you think are really important about training volunteers? If you're going to go on the water and train volunteers, top of your head, three things that are important. Uh, make sure the sailability uh, volunteers have got the right kit on and are prepared to be on the water. I think it's a really real obvious one that gets overlooked quite a lot of the time. So, so we find that suddenly we're on the water and actually our volunteers get cold or dehydrated. Um, looking after number one first. If, we, if we're not fit enough, we can't help anybody else. Yeah. Uh, I think. Don't be afraid to ask for help if you're not sure about something, whether it's at that moment in time over a radio call or whether it's something you're not clear about in, in the venue you're sailing about or the conditions you're about to go into. Please come and ask that person, someone like myself or somebody who's involved with the event. Um, what you know, this is what I'm not sure about. Can you help me yeah, understand this in a better way? Um, and I think that that whole piece around ju just sailor welfare just making sure that the sailors are all right. Um, um, go up along, have a chat alongside, uh, have a conversation with them. You'll, you'll be amazed how many times someone says, oh, can you just help me with this? Or something's fell in the bottom of the boat. Or, yeah, I've got a problem with this. It's wrapped around my foot. I think really important just to have that sailor conversation and the welfare of the sailors. Brilliant. Thank you, Brett. Thank you ever so much. No problem. So once we have all the information, this leads to a decision. So here's what we need to consider. We need to think about the situation, where we are, the sailing area, and the conditions on the day, the type of activity and the boats and equipment being used, the organisation's scope of responsibility, liability, and any constraints, e.g. insurance. What do you think about our volunteers and um, maybe our staff? We'll have a number of people involved in helping deliver the activity. We need to consider their competence and experience the questions they have, the information they need, and the training they need. Balance discussing an individual's needs in a private environment and sharing information on a need-to-know basis. You need to think about what information you share and who needs to know things. And then we need to make a decision. We need to, whether to go boating or not, can we meet the demands of the participants? Will the participants enjoy the session? Will they get what they want from it? What equipment and resources are needed to deliver this safe activity? Are the staff and volunteers comfortable with the plan? Is everybody happy with the plan, what we're going to do? And can we keep everyone safe? In conclusion, almost everything we've discussed is also relevant to ordinary sailing clubs, especially if they're not on our way training centre. The content of the safety boat course, the safety boat handbook, the G16, is relevant and applicable to all sailability groups. You need procedures and to make sure everybody can put this knowledge into practice. There's lots of issues, there's lots of things that can affect a sailing session outside of what we would normally consider. Instance and near miss reporting is really important. There are lots of on-way sailability resources to support you. 
There's the sustainability safety guidance notice that this video is about. There's the RY safety boat course in the accompanying G16 handbook. There's the sailability gain to know people guidance, the RY risk assessment guidance, our race training and event management, the legal aspects. There's the RY accident and incident reporting system. And of course, you have your regional disability development officer who can advise you on all of these things.